Hey everyone, Eddie Wilson here with the Grealty and the American Association of Private Lenders. Continuing our talks on Voices of Reason, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, the market outlook, some funding, some SBA loans and things like that. We've got two distinguished panelists that uh, have uh, not been, um, they, they won't be any stranger to any of you because they have spent a lot of time on our stages and in front of our audiences and we're excited to bring them to you today. Uh, but as a way of just getting started, um, it's it's interesting to me where we are today. Uh, Jeff Tesh, who will come on just after me, and I were talking yesterday, and how drastically our marketplace has changed in just a two-week time period, and then talking about what will happen in the next two weeks. Um, I live in the state of Georgia, uh, where our state has already begun to open up. Um, you know, Jeff Tesh, who will speak, he, he's up in Connecticut, uh, kind of still tied to that tri-state area that is, is reeling from, you know, a lot of what's going on uh, due to the coronavirus. So um, obviously regionally we'll have uh, regional, you know, regional effects will have a huge impact on who you are and what circumstances you're going through, but we'll try to provide some great information and data that's universal to all of you today. Um, a couple of stats that I just want to talk about for a second before I bring on our, our guest. Um, we've, we've got nearly 27 million people unemployed. And uh, that is going to be a stat and a driver that will ultimately determine where the economy goes from a housing perspective over the next nine to 12 months. Um, I've had the chance to interview and talk to a couple of high level chief economists for Fannie Mae, for uh, for Redfin, for NAR, and um, these men and ladies have all been very gracious to give their opinions and their thoughts, their ideas. Uh, but many of them will agree on on a couple of items, and and uh, the items that I want to just talk about for a second, I, I think that you know, as a as a voice of reason, we also want to be a, a voice of positivity, because. Many of you that are think that are think reality constituents or AAPL constituents, you're you're in one of two camps. You're either number one, afraid for the future, terrified that your business is not going to sustain the uh, the test that it's going through today, or you're in the other crowd that is looking opportunistically at the future, saying this could be the greatest opportunity I've had in my lifetime. Um, I read just this morning uh, in the Washington Post where uh, a journalist said he predicted that within the next two years, it would be the greatest transfer of wealth that our world has ever seen. And he believed that it is now being spurred by the events we're going through today. Um, so either either way, you know, you may be on the still on the fear side, still reeling with, you know, is my business going to survive? Uh, is life as I know it going to be the same? Um, or you might be on the other side, well prepared and ready for opportunity. Um, but I want to just give a couple of stats here that I think are relevant to the discussion. And that is, you know, nearly two, uh, 27 million people are without work today. And as the economy opens back up, um, all three economists that I uh, spoke to in the past week said that that number by all means should be cut in half nearly immediately as the economy opens back up. Um, the interesting part about that is, is if you go back to 2008 and 2009, um, we know that our unemployment numbers were near, near 12 to 13 million. So if you look at that number of 26, 27 million people unemployed today, and that number gets cut in half as our economy and our people go back to work, um, it essentially puts us back at an employment number that looks really similar to 2008 and 2009. Now, a number that we've all looked at is that in 2008 and 2009, those who lost their jobs, 13% of that grouping of people also lost their homes. Um, and so, you know, I also had the chance to talk to an economist at J.P. Morgan Chase, and he said that because of the fast acting of Congress and legislators and also with the interactive uh, nature of the Federal Reserve and what they're doing in our current marketplace, 
that they don't think and he doesn't think that that number of 13 percent uh will will be even close to where we are um but all of those economists have agreed that it will have some impact on the on the uh, housing economy and the housing stock um so with that being said you know i've asked each one of them uh what how many foreclosures do they think that our current status and what's going to happen over the next nine to 12 months will bring into our economy? Um, and at the low end, I've received numbers of somewhere in the neighborhood of 800,000 uh, foreclosures coming into the marketplace, all the way up to 1.7 million foreclosures coming into the marketplace. If you're looking, at, uh, looking for opportunity, there's huge opportunity there. Um, not we don't know how fast those foreclosures will come into the market we don't know if they'll trickle back in over the next 12 months we don't know if the layoffs of uh, legal staff uh, tied to these big banking organizations are going to put us in a situation where we were in 2009 where the foreclosures um, you know took a year or two there were people sitting in their homes not paying their mortgages for two years before they were asked to leave their homes we don't know if, if that's gonna be the case or if it's gonna be a lot quicker. So all of them agree that there will be some impact to the economy. There will be some foreclosures that come in somewhere in the neighborhood of 800,000 to 1.7 million foreclosures that'll come into the, the economy. But the other part of it that's interesting is asking them the same questions. I asked them the questions, okay, so how fast, you know, they all kind of predicted that this would be some sort of a V, you know, not necessarily a, a typical conjunctive wave that, you know, has this long elongated trough and then a slow rise. They believe that it's a, it's a bounce back. It's, it's a quick return uh, because this recession really is government induced by the shutting down of our economy. And most of them said, actually three out of the four said that they believed that because of the demand on our housing stock um, today and how the housing economy has reacted to our current economic situation, that they would be uh, surprised if we don't see increases in the values of our homes in the next 12 months. To me, that's really, really, you know, uh, interesting because you know, you go through a situation like this and you think, well, if there's 800,000 or a million, you know, foreclosures that come into the market, it has to devalue the, the, prop, you know, the property values across the country. And each one of them stated that most likely we're going to see an increase because of demand. And so that there's going to be a feeding frenzy on these properties, whether it's hedge funds or Wall Street coming back into the mar market fast and furious, or whether it's real estate investors who have dry powder. Um, we are seeing just a really interesting uh, thing take place. And we'll all look back, I believe, in 10 years at this point as an anomaly to say, you know, I don't, I don't believe that this is a benchmark. I believe this is an, an anomaly. I don't know that we're ever going to see something like this happen again in our lifetime. And I'm looking at it from an op opportunistic, op, you know, uh, optimistic standpoint, looking for the opportunity. So we've got uh, two great, um, people for you today. Uh, before I jump to them, I just want to point you, if you're an AAPL member, uh, that you can go get more resources um, on our current market situation, all the, um, the data that we've been putting out, all the PowerPoints and the, the, uh, the webinars and, and Zoom calls. Um, you can go to aaplonline forward slash, uh, dot com forward slash COVID-19. Uh, there's also a form there that asks you what you need. Um, we have a lot of lenders that are still lending. They're lending out of discretionary funds, trying to deploy capital. And uh, if you need capital, that's a great place to, um, to let us know and we'll point you in the right direction. Uh, if you're a lender who's trying to deploy capital and you need to deploy capital, it's a great place to fill out that survey as well and we'll point you in the right direction. If you are a Think Realty member, you can go to thinkrealty.com forward slash COVID-19, find similar resources for real estate investors um, and uh, again, just trying to be a help for you. If you have any questions, you can always email me at ewilson at thinkrealty.com. And then as we go throughout this presentation, uh, there is a, a question section in your GoToWebinar uh, dashboard there, and you can ask questions. So each speaker will speak, then we'll address the questions that you asked during their presentation. 
and I'll moderate and uh, make sure that uh, the questions get asked. And so if you don't mind, if you're thinking and you're sitting there listening and you wanna ask some questions, feel free to type them there in the question uh, section. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my good friend, uh, Jeff Tesh. Uh, Jeff is the CEO of RCN. Uh, RCN has been a great partner to both Think Reality and AAPL. And uh, we're excited to have Jeff with us. Jeff, are you there? Absolutely, Eddie. Good awesome. afternoon. Well, take it away. It's all yours. Well, thank you so much. And uh, once again, thanks for the kind words. And hello to the American Association of Private Lenders community, as well as the Think Realty uh, community. Great to be with you today uh, once again. So, uh, you know, Eddie came to me a couple of weeks ago, and he mentioned that it would be really great if I could sort of give uh, not only the lending community, but the investment community, sort of a of, of behind the scenes peek of how this crisis has played out and how RCN Capital as a nationwide lender has dealt with it and continues to deal with it and sort of what our view is going forward. So we've set up this presentation today as sort of a bit of an autobiography of, of how RCN has handled it and in particular on how I viewed things and, and how we've moved forward. And Kat, if we could go to the next slide, that would be great. So just a little bit about RCN Capital. We are a nationwide uh, direct private lender. So what does that mean? That means we use our own discretionary funds. Uh, we are set up as a direct lender with our own monies invested in our company. Uh, we founded the company back in 2010, uh, really coming out of the previous crisis uh, as an opportunity to lend monies to investors across the United States to buy, renovate, and sell. Uh, and as time moved on, we, we eventually got into the rental business over the past four or five years, uh, which as most investors know on the call today has been absolutely booming. So uh, we provided products to not only acquire those properties as a single asset, but also as portfolio. And then also uh, we delve into the multifamily bridge. So buying, renovating, and selling in a short-term manner. So really proud of the company that we've built with the amazing team members uh, here at RCN Capital. Uh, next slide, please, Cap. So uh, next, I really wanna take you into the timeline of, of how we all started here. So. Um, January, February, we, we like many lenders uh, in our community, were rolling, right? Uh, we had a winter that was mild. Uh, our investment partners across the United States continued to acquire properties at a breakneck pace, and we were setting uh, records uh, in what's typically the slowest time of the year, which is the dead of winter, January, February. Um, and then, you know, the COVID crisis began to pop up. I certainly was monitoring it, although it was a half a world away uh, in February and, and was concerned, uh, certainly from the human aspect, but figured, you know, it was gonna have may, be very difficult to make a jump over here um, as the Ebola never really made it. And many of these other viruses that we've heard about and tragic consequences across the US, but was concerned, but when the Fed came out on March 3rd and cut the Fed funds rate by a half a percent, that was a wake up call to all of our community, not only the lender community, but it was a wake up call to the investment community in general, that the powers that be felt that there was a risk building and we needed to be aware. So of course, as I mentioned, you know, we were firing on all, all cylinders. I was off to California uh, and I was speaking at a residential mortgage origination conference on March 5th, uh, record attendance at this particular conference in Orange County. Um, well over a thousand people, your traditional conference, packed room, speakers, trade show floor, the whole nine yards. Um, of course, I spent, you know, that, that day and a half shaking hands, hugging friends, all the things that many of you have seen me do over the years. 
Uh, and if you don't know me, I'm a very engaged people person, and, and we thrive at RC at these conferences. So we were out there. Um, but, you know, in the background, COVID was, was, was beginning to have an effect. And people mentioned it, but weren't all that concerned about it. So March 6th, I fly home. And, and that was really the wake-up call, right? The flight from L.A. to New York was half full which that flight is almost, I've taken it so many times, it's almost always full. And there were 10 people wearing masks on that flight, which, you know, I certainly wasn't one of them. I wasn't concerned. But once again, it was a wake-up call as to what was happening. And I began to strategize on the flight home as to what our next steps were going to be. And really, from from a lender's perspective, this gives you an idea of how we were starting to think, right? So I'm back in the office the following Monday, met internally with the head of treasury and our, our controller, and I sat down with them, and I looked, uh, our, our treasury is out of office, but I, I looked at our comp, my controller, and I said to him, I said, I want you to run a profit and loss with zero closings. And I got to tell you, the look that I got back from him was one of disbelief and had I lost my mind, meaning how could we go from setting a record to you wanting me to run a P&L with zero closings? But that was where my head was at. I began to think about worst case scenarios. And it's really important for all our partners on the call today, whether you're on the lending side or the investment side, that you understand what we were facing as a company. So we ran that P&L, uh, and it came back strong. Uh, we were well capitalized. We, we service all our loans here at RCN Capital uh, on the bridge side. So, you know, it was really important to me as a leader that we made sure that all of our customers that were counting on us to service our draws, that we had everything that we could possibly do to maintain uh, full engagement with them. And then, of course, on the other side, we convened a meeting to discuss remote protocols. So the next day, all the managers got together and we sat down and my mandate was, you need to make sure that when we have to evacuate this office, and of course, at that time, it wasn't uh, will this happen? It was a sort of, this is kind of where we're going, uh, that our entire company can be remote and handle that. And, you know, I'm sure many of my, not only uh, customers, but uh, fellow lenders struggled the same way I did, which was, does everybody have a laptop? Do we have VPN capacity, virtual private network? Do we have enough bandwidth so that everybody can do their job remotely? Um, and that was quite quite a challenge, uh, but we were up to it. Next slide, please, Kat. So, you know, by mid-March, the, the week of March 7, 16th, um, that's when everybody across the nation realized just what was happening in the investment funding space. And basically what happened is the, all of the investors pulled out of the secondary market and liquidity dried up. Now, let me just take a moment here to explain sort of the plumbing behind the scenes, how that works. So RCN Capital, right? We're a private company. We're not public. We're funded by our own capital that we, that we use on a regular basis to fund loans. But the way we're able to scale and the way most of my fellow national lenders scale is that we access the capital markets to be able to basically pool our loans into what's known as securitizations. So basically what will happen is all of our loans that we close, they get put into a financial instrument, typically a bond, that gets sold off to long-term investors. These could be insurance companies, they could be teacher's pension funds, they could be real, in, real estate investment trusts. There's any number of uh, financial vehicles that fund our debt. Now the beauty of this is it allows us to access inexpensive capital. There's nothing more expensive for a lender than your own equity. Your own equity is the most expensive capital that you have. 
So by using the, the, this leverage, it has enabled not only RCN Capital, but all of my fellow lenders to slowly but surely be driving down the rates um, as we've enjoyed over the past five years that the capital has flowed into our space. So when the secondary market dried up, basically what happened is all of those companies that I mentioned, the REITs, the pension funds, the insurance companies that buy these bonds stopped. And if they stop buying long-term debt or short-term debt that we securitize, that means all of our partner hedge funds that bundle these immediately stop. So for all of you, uh, especially on the customer end, the direct uh, beneficiaries of this capital, wonder how did this happen? That's how it all happened. The money just stopped and it literally was like flipping a light switch. Um, so of course we immediately took action. Um, we um, sent out our first coronavirus update email to customers, letting them know that we were gonna be pausing funding until the liquidity returned uh, to the marketplace and we could make more informed decisions. In addition to this, we began considering how would this crisis affect valuations. Finally, the first round of our RCN employees that week went remote. Anyone that wanted to go remote, we gave uh, the permission to. Next slide, please, Kat. So the week of March 23rd, by that following week, we mandated all employees work remotely. The crisis was burgeoning, and here at RCN, the, the very first priority had to be the health and safety of our employees. And not only from uh, just a, a straight up humanitarian process, but if one employee was to get sick and infect others, it could really affect the ability of the company to operate, and that's the last thing we wanted. So we made sure as a company to get everyone out of the office well before the government mandates were implemented. And then finally, we sent out another update to all of our customers talking about how the liquidity in the marketplace had frozen up and what it looked like and what we were trying to do to handle that. Next slide, please. So the next few weeks go by, and, and I've said this many times to my own team and team here internally is, it was, it's been like Groundhog Day. Bill Murray's fantastic movie. You wake up every day and it was more of the same. The, the liquidity is frozen in the secondary market. Valuations were in question. And meanwhile, the ramping up of the medical situation became worse and worse and worse. And, you know, being here in Connecticut, and Eddie, you were kind enough to mention this, you know, we've been on the front lines here dealing with really ground zero. I mean, certainly it's been worse in New York City, but um, you know, it, it got to the point where no one wanted to leave their house, even to go to the grocery store. So getting to the middle of April, it was a slow but sure ramp up of crisis. But at the same time, RCN Capital continued to operate because of the protocols we put in place. And we were really proud of that. So slowly but surely, we worked internally with our treasury team to develop a way that we could re-enter the marketplace with our own capital. And basically, that means that we weren't counting on the secondary market coming back. And I'll speak more on that, but it has yet to re-enter the marketplace. And we were going to begun, begin funding loans with our own capital, very similar to the way we started the company 10-odd years ago making loans with equity, and then balance sheeting them. And unfortunately, as time went on, it became very apparent that this product was going to not only have higher coupons, but it was gonna have lower leverages. But we were really adamant about getting back into the marketplace. So that's what we did. Next slide, please. So once we re-entered the marketplace, we began to do all the things that a lender normally does, but it, it was all very different. 
ordering, ordering appraisals was not always the easiest thing to do. Our partners at Appraisal Nation have been amazing. They've gotten us access to most every appraisal that we've needed to do, but it's been challenging. As a company, we internally have really begun to think about how this marketplace is going to look. And as, it, as the month of April wraps up, what, what not only May is going to look like, but June, July, and after that. And, you know, some of the bullet points that I've put here is, you know, inventory of homes were falling. And basically that meant that prices were rising. The low inventory was a sign, and Eddie, you mentioned this, very different from 2006, seven, and eight. Demand for housing is as high as ever, even as we continue to navigate this crisis. And next slide, please. So some of the things that we've done here is we've really gone uh, sort of knee deep into some data research, trying to figure out what the demand side is going to look like on the other side of this. And we've put up this chart today from realtor.com. And basically what this chart shows you is sort of the reality that everyone on this call today has lived over the past eight or nine years, which is a never ending increase of the single family home in the United States being used as an investment vehicle, not only from a short term buy, renovate and sell, but from an aggregation of single family rental. This chart really tells the story. And the reality is, if we were having this conversation two months ago, some of the things that I would tell you is the millennials that are beginning to want a backyard don't necessarily want to own a home. This is providing a tremendous opportunity for investors in this space to not only buy and flip, but begin building a rental portfolio. And that's what we were seeing in RCN Capital. Almost 50% of our origination at the end of February was made up of loans uh, aggregating single family homes. And it's really important that everybody on this call today understands that, which is however the urban model is gonna shake out, the single family home demand clearly is going to continue, whether it be on a flip basis or on an aggregating rental basis. Next slide, please. So we believe that it's time to go on the offensive, not only from a lender perspective, but also from an investment perspective. We don't believe that there is going to be a huge correction in pricing across the United States for workforce housing. That basically means government guaranteed loans in whatever geography that you happen to reside in will continue to be the bread and butter. Now, on the higher end jumbo loans and in certainly um, hard hit urban areas, such as New York City, we do expect a larger correction. But right now at RCN, we're forecasting no more than a five to 10% cre excuse me, correction across the United States in the standard workforce housing. Now, I am gonna give you one caveat on this. For some of you who also dabble in the traditional residential mortgage origination business, it's really important that all of my lender friends and all of my investment partners on this call today understand what's happening in the traditional residential mortgage business right now. So broad strokes, across the United States, there's approximately $20 trillion in untapped equity as to the, the most recent valuations at the end of the year. So theoretically, that number should give any sort of conventional lender a great deal of security that there is a large buffer, unlike the last housing crisis. But what you need to understand is the Federal Housing Administration, FHFA, who owns Fannie and Freddie, um, basically through the government edicts, have allowed forbearance 
for customers of those GSE loans, those government-backed loans. Basically, they've allowed up to a 12-month forbearance whether or not, and this is a key point, whether or not you're affected by the crisis. So there is no means testing for the uh, GSE loan holder, the end customers who request forbearance. Basically, they call up their servicer and they say, I need forbearance. Now, the reason this is important is because of what we're experiencing from a strain on the residential mortgage origination system. Approximately as of uh, yesterday, the latest data I pulled, approximately 7% of all Fannie Freddie mortgages, including the Ginnie Mays, which are higher leverage, approximately 7% of all of those mortgages, there's been some sort of forbearance requested. And rough numbers on that, that's approximately about 30 billion in payments over four months. And the reason I give you that stat is, Fannie and Freddie have come out with an edict to all the servicers that they are required to cover those payments for those four months. So if Mr. and Mrs. Jones calls up and says, hey, I lost my job, I can't make my payment. Well, it's not the government who's covering the payments for the four months, it's those independent servicers. So those independent services are for-profit businesses. And typically when for-profit businesses begin to have a cash crunch, they begin to really narrow their lending field, meaning they're raising credit scores, they're lowering leverage, and any number of in unintended consequences we are beginning to see happen in the residential mortgage origination business. And the reason I'm bringing this up on a private lender call today is it's really important that we understand, especially for those folks doing bridge loans, that the takeout could be impacted by this burgeoning issue with those servicers who may or may not be restricting the amount of capital that they put into the traditional origination area. So, on the other side of that, the medical news continues to be extremely positive the past week, week and a half, which is just a tremendous shot in the arm for the confidence of the home buyers across the United States. So at RCN Capital, we are going on the offensive. We believe even with this uh, COVID crisis, there was not enough single family homes in the United States and there will not be enough single family homes when we get on the other side of this. Eddie, I, ho I, I hope that gave you what you were looking for. Uh, would be happy to take any questions when you're ready. Absolutely, great job, thank you so much. It's so helpful both for the lender and the investor to understand you know, where you know, people such as yourself are in this time because you know, m many of them don't have a, a complete understanding, a, a total understanding of the marketplace and everything that's going on. Um, I don't see any online questions here. And again, you know, if you have a question, just, uh, you know, reach out. There's a question bar there you can write. But Jeff, I, I think I've got a question here while maybe others are preparing theirs. Um, you know, we're addressing both the lender and the investor. But um, as an investor, I've had so many of them ask me personally, you know, with, with lending criteria getting a little bit stiffer, terms changing, things like that, what can I do to best put myself in a position for the dollars, even if they're smaller in quantity, you know, available? How do I put myself in the best position to qualify or to get those dollars? Is it deal-based? Is it my personal investing strategy? what can I do? And um, I'd like to hear your perspective on that because obviously you're the one that's, uh, that, that is deploying this capital to borrowers. So um, any, any insight on that for our, our investor friends out there listening? Right, sure, Eddie, and I appreciate the question. So really it's a twofold answer. Uh, first off is a new um, ever, and, and really this goes back to sort of pre-high leverage lending. Uh, super importance is put on 
cash that the borrower has on hand. So most of the loans that we're originating today, we are requiring a six month interest reserve paid at closing. And the reason we're doing that is we want to make sure that the customer has the ability to be able to pay those interest charges during the crisis. And we believe that six months will be well on the other side of this. So cash really is king. And that liquidity that we request in proof of funds is, is ever more important during the underwriting process. And then of course, second fold is the, the tried and true, which is the customer buying the property right. Um, there's any number of our customers across the nation that are outside today looking for properties and attempting to buy properties below market. And when we see equity in a deal at closing, it gives us a great deal of comfort when we go to underwrite that loan. That's awesome, I appreciate that. I've got a couple uh, questions here now that have come in. Um, oh, one question here from Andy says, what actions will RCN take now to go on the offensive as, as the market begins to open back up? So, you know, first and foremost, we wanted to make sure that we were taking care of all our existing customers. And that just, you know, we have so many customers across the United States that are actively working on their loans and are calling up our servicing department, which we retain servicing on all our loans. So it's really important that we stay engaged with them. And our, every day we're making draws for folks that are working. So that's really the first point on the offensive. Now, as to new origination, we are actively preparing to roll out more guidelines and attempting to widen that box that we have today, not only from the short-term bridge, but we will be rolling out a long-term rental product at some point in the not-too-distant future, which we're super excited about. That's it. That's great. Um, one more question for time's sake, and then I'll, I'll kind of turn it over to Clint, and then if there are some time at the end, then we'll kind of come back to some of these questions, but man, there's some really great ones on here. Um, one more that we, I want to get to real quick before we jump over to Clint. It says, how are you or appraisers comping out transactions at this time? With volume down, are you still relying on pre-COVID comps? Um, you know, and maybe just to kind of capsulize that, or have you kind of created your your new baseline? You know, like well, how how are you uh, handling the the appraisal situation today? Right. So great question. One of the things that we've done internally is we have our own uh, appraisal management department inside. So what we use is we use our AMC, uh, which I mentioned is Appraisal Nation. They do a great job. Nobody has more appraisers on the ground than them. So. We're able to utilize their data, but unfortunately, there is no data really being provided today during the crisis. So what we're having to do is internally is take that appraisal inside, run additional comps, and come up with a valuation internally that we feel makes the most sense. And once again, I'll reiterate, we believe that in almost every geographic region across the the country, except for some of those uh, hard hit urban areas, we're not going to see more than a five to 10% correction. And that's how we're underwriting today. That's great. Great answer. Jeff, thank you so much. Um, we're going to go over to Clint now. And if we have some time to come back to your questions, there's some really good ones on here. Uh, maybe Jeff can stick around and, you know, Clint, and we can all answer them collectively. Um, the next person that I have uh, for you is Clint Coons. Clint uh, is no stranger to our stage. Uh, he is the founder of Anderson Business Advisors, and um, and it's just a wealth of knowledge in tax, legal, uh, asset protection, setup, uh, retirement. Um, he's just been a great, great addition to uh, to the Think Realty brand. Um, he is uh, a resident expert for Think Realty. Uh, he's, uh, he's been, you know, a huge asset to us. So Clint, I'm going to turn it over to you. I know you've got a lot of great information that you want to go through. Um, and don't forget if you have questions for Clint as he's, as he's speaking, go ahead and type them in the questions bar. Yeah. Thanks Eddie. You know, um, there's been a lot of, uh, concern and questions over the last several weeks with the CARES Act. And what we've done at Anderson is we really delved 
extremely deep into the various funding options that are available for real estate investors and small business owners to help navigate this process because it's been really frustrating if you're trying, you're on the outside and you're looking in, you're wondering, hey, there's all this money that's been released and it seems like I cannot gain access to it. And so what we've been doing is, you know, figuring out what applies to different individuals, what is your best uh, path to actually get some type of, of funding from the federal government, because if the money's there, you know, you might as well uh, apply for it. I mean, it's something that I personally have always struggled with is that if there's, you have this government program and, you know, do you take it or do you not take it? Because you understand that what the long-term implications may be from the debt standpoint, but at the end of the day, you know, this is an unprecedented time. And so you should be looking at it. So, so some of the things that we've been doing and we've been seeing out there uh, with regards to the various programs that you should be looking at, number one, of course, is gonna be the Economic Injury Disaster Loans or what's referred to as the EIDL program. It's, uh, it's administered through the SBA. And that program came out and it was working just fine. But what happened was there was just so many applications. I got 5 million applications and the SBA was just overwhelmed because this program, Economic Injury Disaster, was really designed around regional disasters, hurricanes, floods, things like that. And when you have a national disaster and you have so many people applying for loans or for assistance, they just couldn't keep up. So they actually shut the program down uh, two weeks ago. And it wasn't, it was out of a, a, an overwhelming response, but B, out of funding. And that's subsequently been refunding under, you know, what some people call, um, 3.5 uh, under the economic stimulus package because the money did run out, but they haven't opened the program up yet again for individual applicants. And, and when that occurs, uh, you know, it's anybody's guess. They have, you know, $60 billion to work with there. So if you're a real estate investor and you have a, a properties and you've experienced or you think you're going to experience a decline in rentals, I mean, if you're an Airbnb investor, those people have been hit extremely hard. Um, they have these mortgages on properties that, you know, they don't support a traditional tenant relationship where, you know, they might rent uh, $3,000 a month. Instead, they base their numbers on an $8,000 a month revenue. Now they're upside down and there's no way they're going to be able to cover it. Or with the rules that Airbnb has imposed upon them that when we do loosen restrictions, it's a 72 hour turn. I mean, you just can't make money or it's going to be extremely hard to make money in that context. So what what are you left then to consider? Well, applying for this uh, economic industry disaster loan would be one way to go as soon as they open that up, because the rates are really favorable. Uh, when you look at it, that's 3.75% 30-year loan. Uh, there's no personal guarantees for loans under $200,000, not even asking for collateral. And many of the uh or we've applied for quite a few of these for our clients probably about 600 or so of these loans and now you're starting to see them get funded the if you've already made an application for one the sba is running about six weeks behind and you can call in and and try to get a hold of someone to find out the status of your loan but most likely you're not going to get a hold of anyone and what we've been telling people is that if you've already made the application the way you can determine whether or not you're in the applic or you're in the process of the review process is that check your credit because these loans are, are based upon your credit they're going to do a, a pull against it you're going to see it and then you'll know that they're considering you another way is to check your bank account because most of the people that applied for the idle loan also made an application for the idle grant and again that um the the cares act did not lay out anything with respect to the consideration uh, to obtain a grant and the SBA was uh, authorized to issue guidance on that and they determined that if for those individuals that have employees they would award them $1,000 per employee up to 10 employees to receive a full $10,000 grant which is you know it's money that you receive uh, that you don't have to pay back so some of our clients that had employees in their business because they're an active real estate investor they've set up a corporation maybe they had it themselves or their husband and the wife were, were employees of the company. They've been receiving a couple thousand dollars in their bank accounts. And we've had some of the loans actually pay out as well. Uh, my partner, Toby, was working with one individual who received $500,000 under the idle. Now, 
the determination for this loan amount, that is still something that's up in the air. Some people have said it's a matter of taking your gross income minus your cost of goods sold and then multiplying it by two to determine what is a, the amount they're willing to award. We just don't know um, how they're determining the amount that is available uh, under this program. But one of the things that we've done now, because the guidance has been shifting, there isn't, well, I wouldn't say the guidance, it's just everything about the SBA seems to be like they're always issuing a, a continual guidance on these programs. And it's not a fault of theirs. It's just they've been dumped with this process to handle everyone in the country, and they're, and they're trying to do their best to, to figure it out. But as they start to change things, and we notice this, or we hear this from uh, people that we're working with in the industry, one of the things we've made changes on our applications is that, you know, we've, we've started to wor worry less about what the cost of goods sold are, the expenses are, and more on the income side, because our understanding is that the income is more important on these applications than actually your expenses, which kind of ran counterintuitive to what we originally uh, thought would be important in the uh, determination if someone qualified for this. So the reason why it applies best for real estate investors is because you don't have the active income component uh, that you do with the Triple P program that gets all the attention now in the news for the past several weeks because of the fact that it ran out of, out of money. So if you're looking to find some extra funds, uh, extra funds for you, definitely focus on this once the SBA opens it back up. We've been hearing anywhere from a week to three weeks and this program should be running again. But before I talk about the Triple P, the other thing you may want to consider is an, uh, a Main Street loan, SBA Express loan for, for business owners. There's 600 billion that's been dropped in by the Treasury that's out there that you could possibly apply for. Uh, you might want to look at that. So there's different programs that are available to you, maybe to help you refinance existing debt as well to get down at a, at a lower interest rate. Now, on the paycheck side, if you have an active business, and this is something that's been a, been a problem that we've run into, and I, we really didn't anticipate it uh, with working with individuals who asked us to, to apply for them and to navigate this process, that a lot of people that run businesses, be it a real estate investor or just a general business owner or your lender, private lender, you know, when it comes to setting up your business, you truly need to treat this activity as a business, which means you have to have good books and records, profit and loss, balance statements, tax returns, pay yourself a salary, you know, have those 941s pre prepared to W3s. And a lot of times what you find is that the small business owner, the real estate investor, if they don't take that approach to what it is they're doing, then when an opportunity like this presents itself, they're unable to benefit from that because they're not set up the right way. And so one of the things that we've been seeing with, with a fair portion of the applicants is that they, they don't have the requisite information that the lenders are asking for. And granted, this has been a moving target and it's extremely frustrating. You know, the best bet for people to get um, funded under the Triple P program is always to go to a community lender. Now, many of the community lenders on the first round got tapped out on the first day and they would no longer accept applications because there was only so much allocated to the community banks held back for them. Then what occurred with the 3.5 stimulus, they realized the mistake that was made that the smaller community lenders were actually doing a more efficient job of putting money into the hands of the small business owner. So they allocated a much larger chunk just to the community banks so they can dole those funds out. But a problem that is a, that that it oftentimes arises if you don't have that community bank uh, connection, because you've only been working with the big banks. And unfortunately, you know, with the big banks, it's one of those where you submit the app online. Many times, the app does not reflect your business. They ask for information that you don't have because maybe you're set up as a sole proprietor, so you don't have 941s or W3s. Maybe you're an LLC that you file a Schedule SE to report your income. So again, you wouldn't have the requisite information. So, so it's more of a struggle than you try to contact anyone and no one responds back to you. So it's, it's, it's navigating all this and finding the right lenders that are out there. And a lot of times what we've seen as well um, with the larger lenders, the banks, is that the way that the banks are being funded or compensated for doing all of this is 
uh, based off upon the size of the loan. It's not based upon volume. They chose to go a route where they were going to compensate banks based upon uh, the loan sizes, or, you know, how much did they loan out rather than the number of loans that they're making. So that forced banks into the situation where if I have uh, one business owner that ha is eligible for $2 million and I have 10 business owners that are eligible for $20,000 each, who do I want to take on? I'm going to take on the $2 million one because it's going to make me more money and it's less work for me and potentially less risk because something that people don't understand about the program, the Triple P program, especially if you're applying for it, is that initially under the CARES Act, the banks were actually granted the ability to charge a 4% interest rate on these loans. I think it was repayable initially over 10 years, but the SBA came out the night before and issued new guidance before this program went live. And they said, oh, no, 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 uh, not 4%. It's going to be a 1% loan repayable in two years. And of course, since you don't have to give a collateral or you don't have a personal guarantee, that makes lenders really nervous. I mean, who's going to lend money? I don't think a private lender out there would take on that type of loan unless you knew that the SBA is going to take it off your hands and they're going to cover it. But in order to get the SBA to take it off your hands and cover it, you got to make sure that your loan packet fits their criteria. Well, because the SBA is, was kind of shifting what their criteria was going to be in order to compensate these lenders, lenders decided to go overboard with their request for docs. And that's why you've seen a lot of people uh, frustrated because they've submitted everything they thought was required and then they're coming back and they're asking for additional backup information. And what we've seen as well in working through these loans is that if you don't fit the standard model, you were in business for 12 months last year, you have 941s for every quarter, you have a W3, it is really hard to find the right lender to, to work with unless it's a community lender. And then those community lenders, of course, they want you to have an established account with them if they want to do business with you. So it kind of puts you in this, this in-between ground where you, you can't find recovery. And so one of the things that we've been explaining to investors, and this is something we've taught for years, is that if you've got a business set up, one of the things you should be doing is not only you know banking with a, a Chase, a Bank of America, Wells Fargo, whatever it is, that one of the major institutions, you also should have a community lender as well that you have an established account with that you've built a relationship with. So it can help you in times like this. Many times they can step in and uh, accomplish what the larger institutions unwilling to do because it's just such a large institution. They're not really set up to be that nimble. So the frustration passes down and I get it. However, thankfully the money is rolling out. We've had clients that have been funded. So we've seen this uh, occur. And it's not, I mean, it's just like they say, if you, if you qualify, you get the money, then the, the issue now that becomes if you've qualified for a triple P program, then you've got to spend the money within eight weeks. And there is talk about changing that eight week parameter. Uh, that is bringing people back to work or paying your employees out within the next eight weeks. Because if you do that, 75% of your money is, is spent on payroll. And there's some calculations that go into this. And of course, you've probably heard by now that then that loan can be forgiven um, when you make the application after the eight week period. So a couple of things that I've been talking to, uh, been doing some interviews with newspapers uh, on this. One of the things that the small business owner should should look at if you're you're in that situation and you've already laid people off and you're looking to be bring people back on, let's face it, the economy has changed and the way we're doing business has probably changed as well. So when you're thinking about uh, bringing back on your existing employees, maybe that's not the best choice for you. Maybe you should be looking at bringing on someone that has a different skill set that would help you grow your business now coming into the next you know, year, two or three years, if you think that the, the way you conduct business has fundamentally changed. And so you wanna get out in front of it. Hiring the people that uh, are in the old way of thinking may not be in your business best interest. So I think this is, a, is, a, is an opportunity for people to you know, hire somebody that you would never hire in the past because you didn't see the value in it. Now you do, and the government's paying you to hire this individual. So there, there's some real benefit there. Now, the other nice thing about this program is that the money you've receiving under the Triple P, as I stated, the government will forgive the loan if you meet the requirements for loan forgiveness. Now, 
under every ordinary circumstance, if you're a real estate investor or any business owner, you understand this, that loan forgiveness typically results in taxable income. If uh, I was working with someone, uh, let's say Jeff loaned me uh, $500,000, and then he says, you know what, Clint, keep your money. I don't want it back. I mean, that'd be one reason to go work with Jeff, right? So um, if he gave me that forgiveness, and I would have to factor that in my income. Well, under the Triple P program, under the CARES Act, actually, uh, they actually exempt this because it's a covered loan as it's defined under the CARES Act. That is not included in your income. So from a federal tax standpoint, if you receive $75,000 and it's forgiven, you don't have to recognize that as taxable income. Now, that's from the federal standpoint. The reason I say it's from the federal standpoint, because certain states like California that has determined that that is taxable income to a business that's doing business in California will have to pay state taxes on it. So on the state side, I can't tell you what that's gonna, how that's gonna work out. But on the federal side, here's another little Easter egg that's built into it that a lot of people haven't focused on and they don't see this value. Once that money, you, you receive that money, let's say I receive $75,000 that was given to me, and I turn around and I spend that on expenses, mortgages, leases, employees. I also have now the ability to use that as a deduction against any other income I'm earning this year. So I see opportunities for small business owners or business owners in general that by taking these funds, getting them forgiven, you're gonna receive a tax deduction and maybe your income's down this year so you have a loss, that then presents another opportunity for us to take that loss, carry it back, because under the code we can do now take net operating losses and go back, go back to 2019 where you had a profitable year and pick you up more money by getting a, uh, by amending your federal tax return and getting you a tax refund. So there's a lot of moving parts here that, you know, as you start digging deeper, like my partner and I have been doing, we're unco un uncovering a tremendous amount of opportunities. And the, and the issue that many times it comes up is that for the real estate investor or the small business owner, you become paralyzed because it seems so confusing. If you look at the media, you know, people aren't getting money and, and banks are working against them. Yes, there is some of that difficulty out there, but if you just persevere and see this as an opportunity, like, you know, Jeff's talking about with real estate investing and private lending and all of that going forwards, I'm firmly behind that as well, just with my own investing. Uh, this year alone, I think my partner and I have probably added, I don't know, 20 to 30 properties to our portfolio. And a lot of that investment has been made since uh, February. What I found is that in the offers I was making uh, in January and December, working with uh, sellers, those offers were just languishing there. But once we got into February and things started changing with this with with covid um they started opening up and those deals started flowing really fast for us and and so you know eddie talked about having you know your powder dry if you're in a situation where you can uh capitalize on this i think it's going to be a great opportunity especially even for the private lending side in my experience going back to the 2007 8 9 10 a lot of private lenders uh, made a ton of money because they stepped into the market. Because even though we have these loans that are out there, the Main Street loan, the XBA, SBA Express loan programs and the IDLs and the Triple Ps, those aren't necessarily going to all translate down into uh, the real estate investor realm. They're designed to protect you as a result of an economic downturn, but they, the loans are not to be used for investing. So you know, what you should be doing is taking out the money, using it to cover your existing fine bills and expenses of running your business, keep your other cash that you have dry, use that for your investing, especially as credit markets tighten up. You know, it's going to be, they've already, Chase has already talked about this, raising their minimum uh, FICO score in order for eligible borrowers. So another question then becomes if I'm a real estate investor what am I doing if I if I'm not a private lender and seeing this and I want to use traditional financing what am I doing for my personal FICO score to make it better well there's a you know simple things that you can do many times um, one of the things that we advocate is that if you have a corporation LLC some type of business entity get a get a card set up under that and so if you're rehabbing properties you should be running all of that on a business card that doesn't report back to your personal credit score. So you're keeping that credit score, you know, the amount of credit you're actually using 
uh, uh, lower, and so it helps improve your score because of the goofy calculations they use uh, to come up with that. So it's really a matter of rethinking. Um, with the programs that are out there and where this market's going, I don't know, you know how anyone, everyone has an opinion on it, and I think there's a, there is some consensus that it's, that it's gonna be, there will be opportunities, and it's just the question then becomes, have you positioned yourself so that when those opportunities are there, you can capitalize on them? And that is something that, you know, I'm a strong proponent of. So people say, well, you know, you, you got lucky. No, it's where planning meets opportunity is where luck is created. So if you're doing the planning now, when the opportunity presents itself, you'll find that uh, you can possibly benefit from that. So that's about all I had to say, and I'll take some questions on that. Yeah, that's awesome. I appreciate that, Clint. Um, we've got a couple of questions here, um, and it seems like one or two to you, one or two back to Jeff, if Jeff's still available. But um, the first one I see here, Clint, it says, I'm a private lender, not a broker. Uh, I don't have an entity. Um, I receive interest income. Do I qualify for EIDL? And then do you recommend having an entity as a private lender? Maybe a, you know, a broader question there, but um, that, that comes uh, in specifically for you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we'll just first handle the loan aspect of it. So if you're a private lender and you're bringing in interest income, would you qualify for an IDA loan? Quite possibly you could. And what I would, the, the reason I would argue that you, that it would be something you should consider is because you don't know if your borrowers are going to be able to continue to pay you uh, because they've experienced some type of economic injury. So as a result of that, you could apply for a loan now, the, the thing is, is that if you're awarded an EIDL loan, you can't use those funds to go out and relend them to someone else. So you're taking the 3.75 and then you're loaning it back out at eight or 10% interest. That's gonna get you in hot water. What you'd wanna do is use it to cover your ordinary and necessary expenses that you have, you know, cause costs have gone up and your life's been affected as a result uh, of this and you're not bringing in as much money and then use your other funds for lending purposes. Now on the back side of that is should you have a business entity? Well, this is one of those areas that it depends on what type of income you want. When it comes to private lending, you can keep it purely a passive activity or you can make it an active activity or maybe you do a combination thereof. Um, we have clients that will set up business entities for them where they'll lend out of their business entity and then they'll take a portion of that income as active income. And so that would require having a, an an LLC or a corporation. So if you went LLC, it would be taxed as an S or a C Corp. Uh, if you're not interested in that, then just keep your LLC set up to, to hold these funds and lend out of that and just take it as uh, passive income rather than active income. The reason why you should have an entity though is that the entity is going to protect your cash and those notes that, you, that you're holding on to. Because one lawsuit against you, I mean, you become the ideal client or the ideal defendant for an attorney because you're so much easier to collect on when you have someone that has cash and notes versus the individual that has hard assets that are more difficult to levy against. And so, yeah, I would do it strictly from an asset protection standpoint outside of the tax context. Awesome. Great answer. Um, if, if, you know, you're curious about that, that's what Clint does. You can actually go to the link that's on the screen. It says andersonadvisors.com forward slash think cares. Um, he gives a, a, a kind of a, a cheat sheet and an overview there that you can download um, on what you qualify for from loans and things like that. And then also you can reach out to Clint directly there um, to talk about maybe setting up um, assets for yourself. Clint does it for thousands of real estate investors and lenders across the country. Um, this question, I, I want to direct at both of you, um, but let's start with um, let's start with Jeff. It says, I lost my W-2 job due to COVID-19, but my seven rentals have been cash flowing. My credit score is good and we can put more than 20% down. With the W-2 job loss, will I still be able to get a loan for another buy and hold rental? Uh, that's probably a, a lot there, you know, Jeff, because of capital market and term lending and things like that. But if you want to kind of address that generically and then Clint, if you want to jump in and talk about that as well, you can. Sure. Thanks so much, Eddie. You know, on the underwriting perspective for uh, cash flowing rental properties, 
we look at each property individually and how that property cash flows. And with the COVID crisis, we're doing overlays of the ability of the guarantor to be able to guarantee certain number of months of those initial payments. And we've been requiring some interest reserves just to get the loan started. However, we do not require uh, a W-2 uh, on the long-term rental loans. So that would not bear any uh, any effect on the underwriting. Very good. Clint, you want to jump in there at all? I got a question for Jeff on that though. How about on the appraisal of the property? What are you doing there? Yeah, so it sort of goes back to the to the question earlier, which is how are we handling appraisals in this COVID environment when there's really not enough data to be able to say what the property is worth today. So we continue to use our appraisal management partner and then we're bringing them internally and making adjustments with our own internal appraisal department. But overall, we, we really haven't seen any more adjustments um, more than a five to 10%. So the values from what we're seeing are holding up pretty well so far. Well, that's great. No, so uh, I wouldn't have much to add on that other than, you know, there's, there's two different models out there. You're, you're going about it, the traditional method, which is to finance your property and buy it. What I've seen now, a lot of interest is going to be in subject twos. So you're actually picking up the properties subject to the existing underlying mortgage, or you'll see people doing a sandwich lease option on the property with a, you know, with a two-year option, tying it up, trying to cash flow on the property off another tenant, and then exercising the option when you see uh, values uh, bounce back up in the, in the future. So, so if, if you struggle with the traditional capital way of financing property, you may want to look at alternative strategies, uh, that are out there. The thing about it, you know, Ed, you, you guys know this, uh, I was talking to this, it was an article in Forbes two weeks ago or so. And I was talking to the reporter about it, about these strategies and th they didn't understand it that you could you know acquire property without having to actually finance it using other people's financing and i said she goes why don't more people do it and i said well hey, because people don't know about it and they just think it doesn't apply to them i mean you just got to get out there you just got to make an offers and somebody will accept them and our question was well, how do you know when these strategies don't work any longer well when people quit accepting your offers that's when you know so if you're a real estate investor, you should be utilizing this time to take advantage, uh, I hate to use the word take advantage, to capitalize, to to see where the opportunities are, and then go out there and um, acquire some real estate. Great point, Clint. You know, um, I was working with a real estate investor that um, was sitting on about 14 deals, uh, lost, you know, kind of all in one fell swoop, the lending for those deals. Um, was really working hard to try to find a lender to kind of take take these kind of short-term deals that he was doing. And I asked him a question. I said, well, have you ever thought about just going back to all 14? They were all distressed situations. I said, and just asking for an owner finance option. And he was like, you know, he was like, I used to do that all the time. It never even dawned on me. I've gotten into this mode of always using, you know, private capital. He said, it's just, just easier and, you know, and, um, he went back and uh, nine, I think out of the 14, all extended owner financing for him, you know, and it's like, then he could just move forward with the deal. So it, it, it you know, in a situation like this, it causes us to get to get uh, creative um, or to go back to maybe the way that we did it in the beginning. You know, a lot, a lot of people started with very little capital to work with, um, you know, so that's great. Um, let, me, let me do this. I know for time's sake, we're starting to run low on time. Um, I'm going to ask each of you just one kind of question to end the uh, conversation. And then um, I'll have Kat or Carmen pass over the questions that are still kind of outstanding to you um, that, you know, and obviously if you have um, questions, you can email both Clint and Jeff directly and uh, they can help you out. But um, we've got a question from Erica here, and I think it's a great question. And it said, um, if you could change any aspects of how you handled this crisis, would you and in what way would you do so so i'm going to answer that really quickly and i'm going to turn it over to jeff to answer it quickly and then clint to answer it quickly and then win the call but um 
Erica, that's a great question. You know, hindsight obviously is always 2020. Um, and there are lots of things I'd love to do different. Um, but the, the first thing that I would do uh, is, is begin to not kind of wait on the situation to unfold to prepare for the next phase. We all kind of knew innately what was coming down the pipe. I mean, like once they started talking about shutting the economy down, we all knew what that meant. But many people waited for weeks to really formulate the formulate their plan and their their plan of attack for the future. Um, what I would have done immediately was um, taken, you know, kind of everything that I had and and kind of put it into this reserve pile, um, as opposed to just kind of letting everything kind of play out for a few weeks in order to keep as much powder dry as possible so that I could invest in the opportunities to come. Uh, we know there will be opportunities on the on the back side of this. And um, while I do have some powder dry, and I am excited, and like Clint said, like a lot of the deals that I was excited about in putting some rentals, additional rentals in my portfolio have happened. But, you know, I probably could have put a little bit more powder aside um, and uh, and relied more on the PPP program or, you know, the other programs out there to kind of fund my operational structure. And then... Um, and then had more to invest uh, in the future. Um, and then the the other thing that I would have done um, would I, I would have um, uh, worked harder um, at building relationships uh, in the areas that I knew that ultimately were going to be distressed. I think some of the greatest opportunities are going to come in the near future in the hospitality and in the commercial space. And um, while I've, you know, kind of passively added some hospitality and some commercial to my portfolio, I would have actively been looking at those opportunities uh, as soon as things happen, because you could almost predict that those were going to be the, the areas that were hit the hardest um, to position myself to get into a place where I could find those distressed assets quicker and, and start um, adding them to my portfolio in the near term. Um, Jeff, how about you? Anything you would change? Would you do it all the same? add anything to it and then we'll go to Clint after that. Yeah, sure. So, you know, once again, hindsight's 2020. Um, I would have liked to definitely have more capital reserves that were undedicated uh, for such an emergency such as this. Now, you know, kind of the way lenders like myself work is you've got equity, you've got warehouse ability, and you've got uh, large capital providers, which is the securitizations that I talked about, right? So equity is the most expensive, warehouse is the next expensive, the large capital is the least expensive. I would have liked to have had more warehouse, uh, which costs money, right? Like when you have a, it's like a line of credit for your own personal business or your own home, right? Uh, many lines of credit, they charge you if you don't use them. Um, and I, in hindsight, would have liked to have had more undedicated space that I wasn't using um, from a warehouse capability. Um, and, that, you know, there's no getting it now. There will be down the road, but I would have liked to have more than that. Because to your point, Eddie, I could be even more entrepreneurial than I am today in originating loans at at, at you know, very different terms than they were two months ago. Very good. How about you, Clint? Anything you change? Nothing. You know, it, it's after going through 2007, eight, and nine, um, it taught me a lot about getting in front of something. And, and of course, you know, leading uh, into it rather than following into it to, to whatever was happening. And so, yeah, we started planning in uh, late January and started making changes to the business and the model and how we were conducting things. And it, and it really, our our models, everything we planned out, uh, we've far exceeded. So yeah, I'm pretty happy where we're at. That's awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining today. Um, I really appreciate it. We'll pass some of these questions over. If you didn't get your question answered on here, feel free to reach out directly to them. Um, and then again, you know, both on AAPLonline.com uh, forward slash COVID-19 or thinkreality.com uh, forward slash COVID-19. We've got lots of resources on there for you, webinars, all kinds of different things. I think, Clint, we've even got, you know, a, a complete kind of version of what you talked about uh, on there today. 
Um, I appreciate your time today. I hope that uh, it was of value to you. I know it was to me listening to both, uh, both parties. Um, and thank you guys so much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Clint, for being a part. Thank you for being a great supporter of our brands and uh, all of our members. Um, I know you guys bring huge value to uh, the marketplace. And, um, and obviously, you know, from, from my perspective, these are two guys that I trust. Uh, these are two guys that I have a lot of faith and trust in. Um, or, you know, I wouldn't ask them to come and be a part of this today. So uh, obviously, you know, I trust them. And if you have um, opportunities, you know, I, I wouldn't hesitate to reach out to, you know, RCN or to Anderson, both great companies. So thank you guys so much today. And again, if there can be any help uh, that Think Realty or AAPL can provide to you, the listener, let us know, reach out to us, uh, touch us on social, uh, read our local uh, and and most recent editions of our magazines and all the content we put out every day. Um, and let us know what you're thinking. Let us know where you are. You are. And uh, I hope you have a great day. And uh, I hope that everybody's staying safe out there and, and healthy. And uh, we will come to you again here in the very near future with another one of these. Uh, and if you have any comments or questions on, you know, what we can bring to the table after the next Voices of Reason, we're, we're happy to oblige. So thank you so much for listening. Have a great day. Thanks, Eddie. Bye-bye. Thank you.